Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Cover Inspiration with Dio Israel. We have the privilege to have with us this morning Nigeria's Minister of State for Education, a two, uh, former member of the House of Representatives, and a former governorship aspirant of Imo State, a private sector experienced technocrat who is now in politics. Uh, I'm not going to mention the name of our guest yet until I bring in my co-host today. My co-host today is a member of the board of SUBE. He has a PhD in education management, Dr. Said Oladapo Ibikunle, PhD. Dr. Ibikunle, thank you for joining the, us and the Honorable Minister this morning. Uh, can you, your, your mic is muted, Dr. Ibikunle. All right. Okay, yes. Yeah. Good morning. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, Excellent. Good morning, uh, how to have the Honorable Minister. Uh, but before I bring the Honorable Minister on the program, I want you to please watch this in a second. Wajuba from Imo State. Born August 20, 1967, he holds bachelor's and master's degrees in law from Imo State University and University of Lagos, respectively. He has been a managing partner at Ayodeji, Chukwu Emeka, Ibrahim and Co. from 1991. Honorable Nwajuba was elected member of the House of Representatives between 1999 and 2003 and was also a serving member of the lower chamber as well as the chairman of the Tertiary Education Trust from Tedford until his appointment as minister. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nigeria's Minister of State for Education, Honorable Emeka Wajuba. Honorable Minister, it's so good to have you this morning. How are you doing, sir? I'm fine. My name is Chukwe Emeka Wajuba, and I work for you at the Ministry of Education. I serve as the Minister of State. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having you. Honorable Minister, before we get into the tough part of the conversation, which is really about what people want to hear, school resumption, school reopening, one of the things that I like to do is for people to understand the mindset behind the office. Because most times people do not trust decision made at the policy level because they don't understand the genuity of art or the passion or the interest of the decision maker. Um, you have been in the house of... Um, uh, of uh, a representative, you have also chaired Ted Ford. Can you share with us some of your achievement uh, in the in Parliament, in legislature, or as chairman of Ted Ford and other capacity in terms of improving the lives of young people and also in terms of contributing to development of the educational sector? You know, this kind of background help people to understand that the person who is making a decision understands what he's doing, and people can better trust the decision coming from that angle. Okay, well, um, first of all, thank you for having me and for the opportunity to um, engage my uh, fellow compatriots uh, in service. Uh, I appreciate I think the Honorable Minister's network from, is from my days as a student union activist in uh, Imo State University. Where I became mm. um, the, 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 the spokesman of the, the Lost Dance Association. Dr. Bukhali, can you hear me? Um, in the sense that oh, yes. we were right. You know, and we used to um, uh, set out exactly what our views were. Right? To uh, Doctor Rukale, is this from my side? Or okay, yes, I wasn't sure. I saw the honourable minister. Yes, I can hear you now, sir. Yes. The internet was fluctuating. <laughs> you were okay. speaking, sir. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. So uh, from 1990, we set up Bayo Deji, Emeka Ibrahim and Co., myself and my partners, and we uh, started 
uh, this work about um, getting people out of jail, you know, uh, you know, doing pro bono services, running around Lagos, negotiating magistrate court, everything, you know, in, in the back in the days. And then we took that a little bit further when I I ventured into politics in 1996. I got elected hmm. to go to the federal house and um, um, could not attend because I think after we had uh, we were not sworn in because uh, General Bacha died. Uh, in 1998, wow. and, and it was cut off. So we had to start afresh. Uh, we rejoined with political groupings at the time, and I got elected again at the beginning of 99, and we eventually got into the House of Reps in 1999. Uh, I was one of the, probably one of the youngest persons at the time, but um, we were quite active, and um, uh, I was entrusted with the management of um, uh, the committee as the chairman of the house committee on works housing lands and re urban development at the time it was it was all one committee at the time because we have very we had very few committees then we just had less than 40 committees and um in while i was pretty much young at the time i the key thing that i brought into focus was the fight with the we strengthened out the democracy at the time we asked chief Adnini then who was the minister of uh, works and that was the beginning of the organization in the house in the house of representatives because we mm. wanted accountability strict accountability strict constitutionalism because we had just come from a military background at the time and if we felt it was our responsibility to mm. ensure the democratic practices mm. and um, my background as um, a lawyer having come to uni life to do my master's degree i was quickly going to enroll at the time i was already enrolled at the uh, university of um, Joss for my phd so I had to come back to serve in the House of Representatives and suspended it for a while. So at the point we were clear that um, democratic institutions, the governance by the constitution was more than anything. And people felt at the time we were a bit um, overboard in fighting the, or not, or, or taking issues with uh, President Obasanjo at the time. Well, we, but we stood our ground and uh, it became what was, called like with articles of those who wanted to pursue but that wasn't the case it was just asking him to just stick with the law and getting you know the law to rule at all times and we kept on that till i went to run for uh, the governor in the state in, yeah in 2002 in 2002 i was elected i became the governorship candidate of ampp in Imo state when i won that primary um true to what you now see Every, people felt that my views were overtly too democratic and le not as conservative as you should be. And I was too young to be um, uh, in, in that kind of race. So just three weeks or four, six weeks to the election, uh, they did a somersault and they said they were going to replace me. So I took all the structures that we had built and moved to another political party, the NDP. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and um, both of us lost anyway. So we got back <laughs> to myself, yeah, and I ran again. But this time I ran on the platform. Uh, it wasn't on the MPP again. We ran on the platform on the Labour, and when because Labour had the people in Labour read through everything I had done in the House, because in two thousand in two thousand and two we had moved for the establishment of a universal basic education commission. That product became the two thousand and Ubeck Act of two thousand and four, because that was when wow. it was eventually signed. Because yeah. we fought for total universal, uh, but you see, when you read the Ubeck law, you find out why it is not so good to be too young. Because at the time, we felt that we should do it by force. That's what we mm. wrote in that law. If you read, I'm sure you guys as Ubeck will be imagining how can anybody go around the street arresting <laughs> everybody? Who wrote this? That was our creation. Um, I've seen uh, 25, 23 years later, or 22 years later, I'm a little bit wiser. So I know that we cannot arrest everybody. But we yeah. had this suggestion that anybody who, who, who does not send their child to school, it was our responsibility to arrest him and imprison him and send his child to school. Well, we found out in practice after 20 years that that's, that's, not, that's, <laughs> that's one of the experience. But that was uh, to show you that we were really um, serious about getting this done. Yeah. Where the, the, one of the key things, as chairman of Works and Housing, I felt the need to extract the Ministry of um, to, to Maintenance as an issue in Nigeria. We extracted from the Ministry of Works and Housing and created FEMA. That is why why FEMA was also uh, the law creative FEMA was also established on that I watch because we felt that the maintenance of roads and I still insist even now it has is it remains one of my own cardinal views 
that um, the maintenance of the assets that the federal government mm. has instituted over time must mm. have a program and workable pattern of maintaining all of them. So truly, mm. between education, works, power, housing, I've, I've done quite um, a lot of uh, engagement. But I ran for governor again because I wanted to translate some of my views in the legislature because I found the legislature a, a bit limiting because uh, you're mm -hmm. discussing with 360 people, you're talking about yeah. another 109 senators before we can forge a view. And navigating that was quite um, interesting. And then, so I felt that uh, if I continue uh, seeking executive power, I can start from mm -hmm. my state and explain to my state what needs to be done. But when I wrote up the manifesto of 2002 and 2003, and subsequently in 2007, a lot of people felt it was too radical, it was too futuristic, mm. because at the time I was talking about what we must do to reverse teacher decline. Mm. Because I saw ahead mm. of now that we will have mm. a teacher decline. And if we have a teacher decline in a STEAM, it will lead to student learning experience decline. So mm. everything mm. is hinged on the quality of what you're bringing to the classroom and how you teach. Mm. We had proposed in 2002 to establish um, a computer uh, engagement scheme because if you're programming for a new a digital world that we have now come to because that's in mm. 2003 when i wrote those pamphlets i was still talking about in the future that we're going to use computers to learn now we are now here and we are still not there so it's mm. those, those are the contradictions in, in trying to achieve something and not being able to achieve them um mm. in 2011 when we had uh, taken a beating at um uh, in ampp all of us agreed that we will um, go with the president and go form our own political party. We then formed the CPC, and um, I became the governorship candidate of CPC again in Imo State in 2011. And uh, uh, we kept uh, the fight on until 20, uh, 2013, when we then decided that, look, we've lost a bit, we've lost our three elections. The right thing is to match with our partners um, who uh, are, the are, you know, the Action uh, Congress, the, the, the ACN, and the ACN with um, its own uh, weight of people who are very, very uh, savvy, people who are already engaged in the progressive movement. Because everything I'm, uh, you can see, hear me talking, and you can see that all of these are progressive ideas. So we went yeah. into, into the ACN, and we saw that the ACN had all these progressive ideas, and they were all you know, on all fours with everything we spoke. So that is reflected in our, uh, in our um, 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 manifesto that we drafted. Fortunately, uh, those who served in those uh, manifesto committees, people like uh, uh, Salam, uh, Barry Salam, Mohammed, Alaji Lai Mohammed, a few of okay, so Kuchibu, all those people are, are still vocal in government and doing the work we're doing now. But um, I, I served in the constitution committee because uh, uh, at the time I had just completed uh, my thesis in just in 2011 for my PhD. So I returned to excuse myself from there to come back to write the constitution. And we uh, produced a, a meaningful document which we tabled to the rest of the committee, which they approved, mm -hmm. which um, is actually a socially democratic, uh, progressive constitution document. that is aimed solely at improving the welfare of Nigeria. That's why we formed a government that is establishing things like Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs. You've never heard yeah. of that before. And disaster can management. Come and say that disaster management. Those are ministries that tells you that this is a people's programmed government. It is a people-oriented government. It is addressing almost everything. He's looking for how to take money that has been earned by the government to take it to the poorest person so that we don't just allow uh, conservatives just match on them and make them uh, feudal um, <laughs> republic. In so those are the achievements we bring to the table and the mindset with which we come. Uh, when, we've, when I came to Ted Fund, in um, 2017, uh, it was a short lived approach because I had to run, go back to the House of Reps because we felt that there were opportunities for the Southeast and the rest of the country to have some sort of interaction. It was at that point that I tried to run in the in the House of to the House of Reps again. I I then um, was in the Ted Fund for a year. In the one year that we were there, we changed the way uh, Ted Fund was perceived. The first thing was to say, look, uh, Ted Fund had been perceived over time as an, as an institution where you just come and you make money. Mm. That was because it's a mm. fund. But we said, no, mm. we're going to reverse all of this. We don't want any more powers. Let's obey the law. The 2011 mm. Act simply says that there will be a board, of, a board chairman 
And I saw my role as board chairman as only to regulate. I didn't want to get involved with contract sharing and so on. So we said all of that must devolve to the universities. And that's what has happened now, because that is the reform we wanted to bring it from. And that was what the president saw in what we tried to do, to say, look, if you want to do any contracting, let the universities decide what they want to do with the monies. It is not up to a politician in Abuja to decide that and, and send them programs and projects that they may not need or that are irrelevant to their uh, existence. Let the universities take their location and decide what it is that they want to do. That is the cardinal role of the uh, TED form. We also address the issue of how this will be complemented by an inspection agent. So now we need to have a model that approves whether these things that are said to have been done by universities, and that's what has now led to the completion of projects that were abandoned for the past 10 years around the University of Canada, you may do it everywhere. We just went around and said, look, this is a government. We can't be, we can't be behaving like we just fell from the moon. Mm -hmm. We just have to make money and run away with it. So it is important mm -hmm. that some people monitor this, and that's what we did at TED Fund. Well, many people didn't like that style. They felt it was too... Mm -hmm. um, Draconian. I'm, uh, uh, I was behaving like a socialist. You don't you like money or something? I said, look, you may love money, you may want to make money, but you don't make it at the expense of human life yeah, and what it is that you've been abstracting with the money. So let's get this work yeah. done. And that was well. I was still in the process when I the president summoned me to come and serve as this minister of state at the Ministry of Education. Now here, one year on, we've uh, reviewed a lot of things. Um, hmm. Hmm. First things first, I believe that Sorry, if we don't improve the Sorry. quality of our teaching profession. Sorry, Honorable Minister. Uh, I just want to quickly pick from somewhere you mentioned now, which is uh, really affecting the uh, some of our, I can say, operation at the basic level, or as it concerns the basic education. I know that uh, before, it used to be Education Trust Fund, before it became TED Fund, which centers yes. on tertiary education alone. But prior to that, there are certain infrastructure, which are intervention funds for basic education. And today mm -hmm. you realize that majority of those structures are abandoned across the country. Let me use that word now. What actually is the plan? Because if they are abandoned, it means they can no longer assess that fund by contractors to finish those projects. What are the uh, plans, mm -hmm. sir, to ensure that, uh, I mean, those infrastructures that are meant for basic education, while they were still assessing the ETF, what are the plans to ensure that uh, they, are, they are completed? Because all of a sudden, the law Yes, it became tertiary education uh, fund. Uh, could no longer the, the basic education could no longer assess that fund to complete those infrastructural development. All of them now are abandoned. All right. Um I, I don't know if I can get Dio to change my name on this platform to on okay. Maker Okay, I, I will do that right to Mecca, that. first to me. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, Mecca refers to how people used to call me in primary school as a, as a you know, <laughs> it's not official, it's like a guy name. Uh, sorry, sir. But let me go straight to, let me go straight to um, um, uh, the question from Dr. Said. Uh, I agree with you. There's all of these places, and I've just seen a, a question from uh, a member of, uh, of our audience who has asked the question, what's the strategy around it? What we did and what we are still doing is that we've looked, we've taken a catalog of everything, everything that, that's what I'm answering. I'm answering the implementation plan. Now, everything that we had seen as abandoned and for which we had provided money over the past 12, 20 years, I asked a review, for a review from all of the two months. We had all that document. As to because we had a reporting system that said everybody bring your brief. Now, immediately we got that, we then decided what is the problem? The contractor ran away. Some of them uh, had paid bribes for uh, governments, they also they alleged they said they had given money uh, to previous governments that gave them these contracts and that they had some people had used it to fight elections in 2007, 2011. So they made all sorts of allegations. And it was okay, right? 
Now, the problem, solution. Solution will be to figure out what is remaining to be done. Are you, as a contractor, willing to continue at this rate? If you're not willing to continue, can you surrender? If you surrender, mm. can we get the university to match you with IGR to complete them? Mm. If the university mm. does not have enough IGR, we can then give them a, a what we call a contracting partner. In which case, anybody else who is coming to do a project there will have to have a surrender value on those properties. In other words, mm. he can continue to use the work plan that he's doing here since he's been attested to be able to be able to do them. And we did that for uh, projects in the University of Nsoka, Calabar, but everywhere in ABU, in ZA, in uh, Medugri, we are continuing with that process. So we are delivering on those. The second part of it is not just with the uh, hard infrastructure you see. A lot of what goes into education is actually soft infrastructure. Um, the conferences we sent our people. So I wanted a, a return on all of the people we sent abroad. I went, I saw the 20, uh, 2,800 PhD scholarships Nigeria is paying for. And none of them who wanted to return, I wrote ministry, uh, uh, embassies to say I want all the people who we have trained to return to teach. Because the reason we sent them for these PhDs was for them to come to Nigeria to help build our own uh, capacity here. So it, was, yeah. it was unconscionable that 80% of, the of them were staying abroad and they didn't want to return. So I wrote back. We started fighting each one of them. And it, it, the same thing we did for master's degree holders. And we went everywhere. Then we then said, look, we're no longer sending people to, just because you wrote or your visitors wrote and you take Nigeria's money and you go to any place, you say, some people just simply use the money to marry the wives, build houses, professors, and did not go. So we compelled them to go. So you must go do this one. I guess, like I said, it may sound too harsh uh, to some people. And coming people believe that you're a young man. Why are you so uh, hard on people? And I felt, look, there is a lot of benefit in doing the right thing. Too many, in mm. fact, the there is more benefit in doing the right thing than actually going the wrong way. And this mm. all had been taken care of. And that's what we did. And we're continuing to in that respect. So I, and I'm very happy to with some of the report that I'm getting from uh, Ted from now that I'm supervising them as minister, that they are really going um, um, uh, strictly along those lines. Because I, I will kick if uh, if I think anybody has changed any of the policies we made there. I'm also proposing uh, to them, and I think the new chairman will implement it, that we now start an insurance scheme around all the projects that we have in the universities. We can't maintain all of this for me forever. So we have to apportion mm. monies from the TED for now towards keeping up those programs and then getting universities to be responsible for them. Because I can't, I don't bear with anybody. Yesterday I was at Orozo for a, a secondary school inspection at one of our college, uh, unity colleges. They will not maintain what you have already built. So what are we mm. going to do? We can't keep awarding contracts for the rest of our lives. This is not, mm. a, no country progresses by pure procurement solely. We must mm. develop the capacity of our people to do uh, this. And that's mm. what I'm asking. And that's all I'm asking. I say. So that is our implementation strategy, to continue along the fulcrum of getting our people to be the owners of their infrastructure. When we finish building it, whatever it is that you have, we must develop soft and, and the soft infrastructure to govern it and the hard infrastructure for you to use. That's what is required here. Uh, Honorable Minister, let me quickly take you back a little bit. You talked a lot about your fantastic experience over the years that talk, that enlightens us on what you've brought to the table as Minister of State for Education. What were the lessons that you've learned between your, your time in the legislature in 2002-2004 and now that you think you would do differently? So you talked, for example, about the UBE Act of 2004. Some of the things that you put into, into the law that you wanted to see because of your mindset at that time. What other things have you noticed that said, no, I think we can do this um, differently? Because this is the reason. People who implement the law, policemen will go on the street, you are saying on the street, they arrest you. Because in law, we talk about mental elements, mens rea and actors reals. So the mens rea behind the decision is also key. You have realized now that that may not work based on your experience and growing up maturity over the years. What other things have you seen that has been introduced but needs to be looked into and tweaked in the way education is being managed in Nigeria today? Uh, thank you very much, Dyer. Uh, the, the truth is that um, life evolves and all of us, only a fool does not change his mind. Uh, every wise man, in fact, the way your mind is now is a product of some of the knowledge you have acquired prior to today. 
So we all are uh, learning. And I concede that even as a PhD in law, uh, that I've now, as a, as a somebody who is a, a, a doctor of law, it is still a learning process. You have learned not enough. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. learning. I'm also learning from uh, the experiences that over the years of what happens and what does not fit. Right now, we have a situation where we can then decide, look, for instance, Nigeria's biggest problem right now in the education sector is no longer infrastructure. It's not just buildings. I want an improvement in the quality of teachers. That is my... That is the where my, my, my heart is wrenched at. Because mm -hmm. I've seen that the teachers we had and the teachers we have now are not mm -hmm. exactly at par. They are not the same quality. Mm -hmm. To the base of what a child and how a child is treated in class. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to build all this nice infrastructure. You can have a beautiful structure, and if you have a fool for a son, he will pull it down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, the important thing is to train the child. So we're mm -hmm. looking at programs that can help us resuscitate the teaching profession and attract passionate, quality people to the and keep them. First mm -hmm. things first is to make their salaries useful and not just useful, but regular and reliable. Mm -hmm. So the person, you, if a teacher says, what makes somebody reliable is for him to be able to keep his word, to be able to be trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Doesn't become reliable, becomes a lie, mm -hmm. becomes a cheat. So we must mm -hmm. first of all aid that. And that is where what you are asking me comes into play. We need to talk to the states. Many Many not pay even the good teachers that they have, they do not pay them well. Mm. Many states that even pay at all do not pay regularly. These mm. days, you find to let sign and they say teachers not allowed. I met mm. with a conference of young people who are in colleges of education, and they're telling me that girls don't want to marry teachers. Mm. How sad can a society be? Mm. Then everybody is migrating to private institutions. Hmm. Who will produce the workforce of Nigeria if all of us become the children of big men? Hmm. People berate me that, why did I bring... I have five children, all of them studying in public institutions in Nigeria, and they think I'm being funny. But I felt that, look, if I'm going to commit to Nigeria, it is all of... Oh, I think the, the network of general minister uh, is having a bit of a challenge. He's going to rejoin us back. Um, Honorable Rukuni, while we're waiting for the minister to reconnect, uh, I, I think I, I enjoyed your, your question at that point because we have a lot of buildings that we had also inspected at our suburb level and they're not, they were built with education trust fund money, but they had been stopped because Ted Fund is not financing. Were you satisfied with the response of the Honorable you. Minister? Yes. No, I'm not. I was still going to allow him to tell us the strategy yeah, to, uh, to to take over those. Yeah. Yes, I, I'm also going, I, I wanted that. Yes. 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 Let him know that at this operational level, such exists. So that you yes. look at the university level, but the, the basic yes. education. Education at sector. primary school level, we have uh, issues like that. And since this uh, fund has been stopped, Okay, yes. for basic education, what is the yes. plan to probably revisit that? And I think one of the important things he has mentioned has to do with the quality of teachers. Because really, mm -hmm. when you look at uh, one of the mandate and, or the functions of uh, the ministry, they're talking about uh, ensuring that uh, they keep the standards of education. Yes. And I was curious about uh, the standard. Who said the standard? What are the standard? By who are, do you measure it? But I think the key thing is quality, which he has mentioned. And that's just the key word I would have loved to hear. And I think uh, the thinking of the Honorable Minister in that line is a good one. Because the classroom is really, like I used to say, is a factory where our products are, are being molded, are being, uh, you know, fine-tuned. 
So, and the only interaction there is between the teacher and the students. So, who mm. is teaching? What is the effectiveness? How do you, I mean, the effectiveness of the teacher in the delivery of the instruction at ensuring that the product who are the students are coming out well, okay, in order to produce the kind of leadership we have for tomorrow. So, the, the, the last year from there, we have been the quality. Standard as yes, well. Honorable Minister, you were. Oh, sorry, Honorable Minister is back. Yes, he's back. Yes, yes. Honorable Minister, sir. <laughs> you were speaking, we're just, sir. Uh, trying to review some of the your thoughts. Yes, I was are, I was lying. actually listening to you, Dr. Said. My point actually is that yes, we, are, we were just trying to we were just we were just trying summarize to summarize your contribution. Uh, you know, Key into your yeah, talk yeah. about uh, yeah about the quality, yeah. which I think uh, actually is uh, because one of the things I was going to ask really before was that when you talk about falling standard of education in Nigeria, you know people see it as a myth or a reality. In other words, there have been questions at various uh, forum uh, where people or fora where people ask who really set the standard. What really is the standard? Because when you look at it now, we have more access to literature, you have access to text through internet. Even the syllabus now that these children have to cover, the number of subjects they even offer now, is so much that even when I was in school. So some people will tell you that they are not thinking the standard is a problem. But the quality of delivery, and uh, that is actually what we have touched. And as a professional, I was just amazed that that is your thinking. Exactly what we were trying to review before you came on board. However, sir, I asked the question, which I think I was going to ask, that I know that for the third form, right now you face the universities. But before you face the university, when it was Education Trust Fund, in our primary schools, we have certain projects that are ongoing. As soon as they stopped, majority of those projects are abandoned at the moment, as I'm talking to you, because we could no longer assess the fund. It's, not, it's now third fund. What would be the strategy or what are the plans to ensure that uh, we complete those projects? Are we relating with the state to say the state should take over? Or are you saying that you can now do a special dispensation to ensure that uh, every state could lead such projects and you now review them again? Because the, the primary education sector doesn't have any opportunity um, to assess the fund again. And we here at basic education level are also, are also concerned about that because we have so much of that project around. Even some that Thank you, Dr. Said. Uh, look, at, look at what happened. Yes, sir. Over to you, Honorable Minister. Like I said, I agree with you. I Thank you, Dad. I said I agree with Dr. Said. This is yes, sir. one of the things that is a problem with us as a country. All of those contracts that you're referring mm -hmm. to, contractors were given the monies in the primary schools and secondary mm -hmm. schools. I've gone ahead to pay. I'm still paying for contracts that were awarded in 2019, 20, 2009, 2007. Now, they didn't take it seriously at the time because you know when people have got these contracts, uh, and I and I don't have any any problem with contracts. All I'm asking is that you do them, hmm. you do them. So the mindset with which Nigeria had been approached for a long time, for for many throughout the you know from military to the early parts of this, which was what actually we came into government to correct, is the mindset. Hmm that you can actually get contract from government, pocket the money, and then <laughs> say goodbye to everybody, and next year we are more than that one. Now, mm. that is the part that I'm not agreeing with. Mm. Anything we have given you to do, you must do it. So I can tell you on my desk, in this last one year, I've signed off contracts that people have come back to complete in those primary schools. Now, if you have mm. any of those primary schools oh. or secondary do, schools, sir. where oh. any of these ETF money, I still have oh, yes, oh. Kindly write the ministry. Mm. Oh. I would follow up on Excellent, that with you, sir. sir. Excellent, Thank you, sir. sir. 
I think one of the I'm happy that we are having this engagement. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> that will be done because we're really taking, we've really done the enumeration of all this. I will do that. You'll see us in the next 48 hours. I can assure you. But well, let me just continue along the teacher yes, trajectory. Sir. Yes, yes. Sir. And I know that because the, 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 suburb, and I know that other suburb across the country are listening to you now. And uh, some will be able to reach you out on that because we never had any opportunity. Yeah, I just write to the that. ministry so that we can just have the facts around it so we can check our records. That's an important thing. Please, it is important. And I keep Thank saying you. government is does not there's no such person called government. There's no hmm. person. Government is a collective of all of us. And if all of us help hmm. in policing, reporting, it hmm. will help everybody. At least hold hmm. me responsible for the ones you report that I didn't go do. Mm, 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 but mm, I can't. Mm, I'm not too big with us. The, the yes. necessity of government is because of his of the of, of the plural nature of his people. That's what makes government yes. ubiquitous yes. because yes, a present. Thank you. Yes. So yes. I understand that it is our collective effort. Yes, yes. Doctor, look at hold on, sir. I want okay. to go a bit. Yes, uh, I want to go a bit professional this time, uh, sir. Considering the mandate and the function of the ministry, I think one of it is to formulate and coordinate the national policy on education. Uh, considering this COVID-19, the post-COVID and the national policy on education, is the ministry thinking in line of reviewing our national policy on education? Or how last have we really had to do that? That's uh, the policy we work in. We are doing that. We are not going to go by the old order. No, we are doing a review. I can tell you, the uh, Ministry really is If I may add, sir. Well, you hear about the document uh, um, uh, as soon as possible. Okay, sorry. Taking I think the line went down. Oh, God. Yeah, I think it's network. Doc, uh, doctor, I wanted him to finish his thoughts around teachers' engagement. Then we'll move into yes, the other areas yes, around yes. post-COVID. Yeah, I wanted him yeah. to finish his thoughts. I, I, I have some of those to, things. I was going to really... I was going yes. to weave that to national policy because you see, policies on education actually captures mm. most of these things. For example, yes. you see, we are you see, have some teachers in the classroom who perhaps are NC holders, yeah, teaching in secondary school. And the policy will be that no, the minimum should be no, sorry, grade two. The policy yes. should have said NC, okay. Yes. So what should now be thinking about uh, the new policy? Yes. I mean, also because look at it now, we are embracing, we are leveraging on technology. To so what extent yes. is certification on yes. a basic ICT knowledge by yes. the classroom teacher will be able to move us forward? Because yes. apart from the fact that right now we are preparing for school to go back, uh, improving the hygiene standard the nutrition standard, uh, the readiness of the teacher to teach is another thing. But one thing is key, and that is the ability to prepare for such eventualities in future. If you are going to have this crisis again, the one we have at the moment and in the future, to what extent are we ready? That is contingency. Okay? Yes. And all this will have been built into our policy. So when you don't have this policy, you know, you see people escaping the road, trying to tell you this, they are doing this because, and by yeah. the time you want to get them on the policy on education, you cannot. But there are no documents that says this is what you do. And don't forget that yes. we are all operating the same policy, I mean, across the country. So that's why I yes, wanted to yes. make sure that the um, issue of policy yes. is taken into consideration. Oh, okay, okay. I, I, what well, I actually want to do, the trajectory said, of... They have just said now that they are reviewing one. So if they are reviewing yes. one, they should be considering what our experience during this COVID-19 is and what yes. should be experienced. So it's good to let him know. He knows, we know we are all uh, in the field, but the public out there are watching. And the minister should yes. be able to commit to the fact that the national policy and education is being reviewed reviewed to take care of uh, you know even the eventualities that may come out of uh, 
uh, of the process yes. in future. Yes, if we can, if you can follow this flow, I, I, what I try to do, what I'm trying to do is that we 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 go from the soft level to the hard level. So one of the things I wanted the honourable minister to uh, to to share with us also is uh, the, the 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 what lesson has COVID taught us, and understanding the lessons that the ministry have learned from COVID. And begin to you know take that into how do they plan to leverage technology and uh, uh, you know what is the next step. So I, I wanted us to to take the conversations from the angle of uh, you know where what have we learned, where are we at the moment, and then moving forward into the future. Uh, but you know if you if you we at least we have been able to get a commitment out of the honourable minister uh, in terms of uh policy in the area where uh, i said we can follow up with them on the area of uh of uh uh the ted fund project that we have existing in lagos i think that is also an achievement uh, on that side we're waiting for the honorable minister to join us back um so that we can uh, continue the conversation uh, around uh, uh the future of education in nigeria and education in emergencies. Um, you, you talked about leveraging technology and the, the policy. Uh, Olua know says, how do we review our policies since the educational calendar has been, has been distorted? Um, I'm sure that the minister will respond to that when he comes back. Uh, Monsur Olowokwejo says, I'll suggest we allow the minister to complete his thoughts on Tija's challenges. Yeah, so when he comes back, we will let him complete his thoughts before we then uh, uh, also look at the other areas that he does have. Uh, Dr. Bola Omisha Deadeye says, did you conduct a potential risk assessment and their mitigation when putting together education strategies? For example, contractors not completing their jobs or lack of fund, uh, in my opinion, this should be considered when putting the plan in place. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the Honorable Minister will answer that as well when this network uh, comes back. A Kingdom of says, welcome him. I'm not sure what that means. Um, uh, sorry, one second. Sorry, I've just spoken to the Honorable Minister's network. Um, just as a bit of a challenge, but uh, they're coming. You know that in federal capital uh, sectariat, the buildings are very high, and there are a lot of buildings, block of buildings uh, surrounding each other. So sometimes the building can be a lot of challenge when it comes to internet network. Um, uh, that, that's Abuja, and that's not the minister's making. Um, I see Ayokiton saying, I sincerely don't know why the Honorable Minister's network is bad. Uh, Mr. Ayokiton, if you're actually in sec federal secretariat sometimes, you may not get the phone network because, you know, there are a lot of buildings that are blocking signals all across. But we are excited and delighted and honored that the Honorable Minister has, you know, taken the time this morning. He had some other engagement, but he said, that I promised you I was going to be here. And it's been here. And I, I'm sure that Honorable Mukule is excited as I am, that we have gotten a commitment that a lot of our schools that have been, uh, you know, left standing because they couldn't access the funds to complete it can now explore uh, that option based on the commitment of the Honorable Minister. And so we're waiting for him to, to reconnect back. Um, yes, Oluwa, you're me We're going to talk on curriculum as well. Uh, you you appreciate that there's a lot of issues, so I'm trying to take the conversation one step. So first, uh, you know, I'm interested first in learning from experience. What have they gotten from the past? Then we want to go into what lessons has COVID taught us. Because see, the Yoruba system, so now the Honorable has accepted that there were some policies that they created that were challenging that they need to look into and review. 
So the same way, if we now say, what have we seen and learned from, uh, you know, COVID, then we can take stock and say, this is what we want to do differently. Then we can now begin to talk about curriculum. We can talk about infrastructure. We can talk about some other radical ideas that the Honorable Minister has. Uh, Dr. Ebukule, you were speaking uh, earlier about about yeah. your your passion, your passion, uh, excitement about the thought of the Honorable Minister. What else did, did you take from the conversation so far? No, that's just this uh, progressivism idea, you know. And uh, I was just going to just going by what you have said. I I, I, I was just going to allow us to um, probably take him up on. Uh, the mandate and the functions of uh, the ministry. If you look at that, it will definitely capture virtually everything we want because they have the mandate, mm -hmm. they have started the function. As a matter of fact, yes. they are stated objectives too. And uh, if you look at that, they formulate and coordinate national policy and education. That should now tell us to what extent they want to review that in line with the post-COVID. Somebody just mentioned curriculum now. It's also part of the mandate. And it is to develop curricula and syllabuses at the national level. So one should ask, to what extent is our current curriculum and syllabuses impacting on the development of the country? Because when you look at it, the world is changing. Things are changing. So the curriculum and the syllabus too should be changing. At the time, of this post-COVID, we should even be talking about uh, reviewing or compressing your curriculum and syllabus. Certain area of the uh, professionally, and uh, somebody should be looking into that. We shouldn't be going back into the old order. So when you look at that mandate and the function, they formulate and coordinate national policy, they collect and collate data for the purpose of educational planning and financing, they prescribe and maintain uniform standard of education throughout the country. They control and monitor the quality of education in the country. That is the area is touching now about the quality mm. of teachers. It's still part of mm. the mandate and the function. They harmonize educational policies and procedures of all the states mm. of the federation through the instrumentality of the NC. And you and I will agree that uh, coordinating these uh, educational policies and procedures across state of the federation is still with some uh, disparity in a way because he's talking uh, about standards. Th 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 there's and a question from Bola Omishade that I wanted you to respond to. It says, for Subeb, do we always need funds? Can teachers learn and empower each other? Yeah. She just said that uh, for Subeb, do we always need funds? Of course. There's need for funds for everything. <laughs> and uh, if you say, can teachers learn and empower each other? That is collaboration. That is professional collaboration. And I think uh, to some extent that is ongoing. It's an everyday thing, which is ongoing. Even at the Subeb level, with this strategic planning, we, we bring together uh, education secretaries from all the AGEA, where we sit together with the policymaker at the suburb level, and we take priorities. And these strategic priorities are documented in the form of a, uh, a pamphlet, so to say. And they go down again and cascade mm -hmm. that to share professional practices and the measurement of our outcomes are also done mm -hmm. at our at our uh, AG level. So, but you'll agree with me that there is this for fund. And government has put so much resources of fund into education. No doubt. But the question is, can we measure the output and uh, mm. probably, you know, relate that to what government has really put? Probably that's the concern of the uh, the, 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 I mean, Dr. Bola Ade, you know, but we always require funds. We need funds for so much. We need funds to pay teachers. We need funds yes. to get the structure. To build schools. They will be locally produced. Even if they yes. are locally produced, we still need funds 
to get those things in place. For example, in Lagos State, we have what is called the whole Excel. That is excellent yes. in learning for every child and activity. This is one of the, yes. uh, uh, the, 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 the program of the governor, Mr. Governor of Lagos State, so at transforming the education, the basic education sector in Lagos Sector. And yes. each teacher now use a tab. Teachers no longer write uh, uh, teachers no longer write lesson notes. All these lesson notes have been digitally packaged on their tab mm. with the time. So all teachers teach the same thing, using the same material throughout our 1,016 primary schools in Lagos State. And all this comes with funds, because if you must have those, uh, uh, if you must leverage technology in education, it means it should come with funds to procure those tablets mm. to ensure that the students are also in tune with technology. And this has created some excitement, even among our teachers. The, the, the teachers in Lagos State, kudos to them now at the primary school level, I know, and I'm sure the same at the secondary level. They now get to school that you notice, they get to school early now. They get to school, say, around 7 a.m. directly in the school. Because as soon as you open your tab to teach, that tab will register you when you came to school. The tab will show the number of hours you spent in class. Not that when you get to class, the classroom, and you just spend 15 minutes and you agree with you. can't do that in Lagos State any longer. Your time spent in the classroom, and whether you finish that lesson for the day will definitely show at the back end. The head teacher we can, man can monitor the number of teachers that are currently teaching. We at Sube can also know the number of teachers that are teaching. So if a teacher cannot finish his lesson, or if a teacher is perhaps coming late to classes, you can know this now in Lagos State because of the eco Excel nature. So we've leveraged technology in ensuring that, and teachers are excited, the pupils are excited, they want to come to school, they want to learn. And all this comes with fun, anyway. So that I think I've been able to attend to that. So like, like, like uh, we were saying before, Dr. Bola's yes. uh, question, you know. So if we pick the Honorable Minister up on the functions, you see, most of the functions are only stated as intentions. But how do they intend? That is what yes. they want to do. So how are they doing it? Or how yes. do they want to do it? You and I, we are in the sector, OK? But for the purpose of education, you and I know how certain things are, 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 are running. But we shouldn't mm. assume that we know all this. But for the purpose of the yes. education, for the purpose of feedback, for the purpose of accountability, for the purpose of report to the larger audience out there, and some others too, who are also upcoming in the education sector, I think we need to really talk about the mandate and the function of the ministry, like I said. And how, do, how are they ensuring that in tandem with the current practice and challenges in the country? These are the reasons why I was trying to pick a honorable minister. But by the time he talks on that, he must have fully uh, educated the larger populace out there about what the mandate mm -hmm. of the ministry is. He must have probably mm -hmm. touched even on some of their programs because this mm -hmm. is one of the rare occasions and opportunity we have to really talk with policymakers. I thank you. No, we, we thank you thank so system. much. Uh, Yes. yes, I'm trying to, they're trying to refresh his, uh, his stuff. They're trying to change his internet connection. I have another question, a uh, comment here from, uh, okay, I think that the other minister answered that one himself directly. Um, let me, uh, there's another one. I think the part-time PhD could be an option. Doctor, you have a PhD in education. Uh, what is your thought about this? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, like, like she said, it's doable. You know, I think the whole thing is all about uh, the fact that we are still talking about quality. You know, we are still talking about quality. If we have confidence in what we produce here, I do not see reasons going abroad. I've tried it one or two times, but uh, I discovered that even we do better here. So the suggestion mm. by Dr. Adeyeye Omishade to say that we can have part-time PhD, 
But you know, in most cases, yeah, to even get supervisors to attend to you, you even have some PhD students that will not see their supervisors attending to them in mm. another one year, not even checking the chapter of your thesis. So the timely completion is one thing. Ability to have an effective and a constructive supervision by the supervisors is another thing. And maybe I want to talk about uh, the, 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 the same thing they are still clamoring for in the university. They are clamoring for, uh, for resources to engage in research, to probably concentrate on their work. You know, the, one of the days when in the university you see them really doing their work. But nowadays, you see professors now, you see doctors, you see people who are even supposed to be in the classroom mentoring others now. They have political appointments, just like my honorable <laughs> self. Even though I've not really been a, a classroom teacher at the higher at the HRE level. So a lot of them are not really having this time. Because even when you do research, I was going to ask the honorable minister, to what extent are people encouraged with the findings of their research? to ensure that we make it public and that we promote it, or probably we subject it to, to mm. international kind of comparison. So we have more input to what mm. the researcher and promote that. Ah. And be proud of it as ours. Even when you do research here, to what extent do Nigerians embrace and appreciate that research? Which starts mm. from and that is what I was going to ask the Honorable Minister, the extent to which the ministry at the federal level is trying to assist researchers mm. in terms of the products. Because one thing is to do, to do the research. Another thing is to now make use of the research work mm. to make sure you subject it to tests. And yes, yes. So some of the PhD uh, 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 supervisors or the professors who are supposed to supervise these students could be another thing entirely. And therefore, they don't want to. They want to do it three years, four years, and they go away. But you see people in the university now spending ten years, spending eight years. I I, I think what we we'll do is we would uh, disconnect and wait for the minister to sort to be sorted out and then come back, then we can go back live. So for those who are watching, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we've had a uh, great conversation so far with the Honorable Minister. He's having a bit of a network challenge. We would post this broadcast, and as soon as the Minister has been able to sort himself out, they're trying to arrange another network um, for him. As soon as that is sorted out, we would come back live and continue the conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Ebipule. I'll see you when we come back live. Actually, I'll yeah, see you, you in a few minutes. You are next door to me. Thank you, my neighbor. That's a good one. Absolutely. Yeah,